Even before the first full-length episode of The Simpsons aired, Fox was preparing a big marketing push for the show. Merchandise was everywhere. Anything that they could put The Simpsons on, they did. With Bart Mania going wild in 1990, the tactic was a huge success, with $2 billion made globally selling merchandise in the first 14 months alone. It shouldn't be too surprising then that while Konami was working on The Simpsons for Arcade, a different developer was working on a completely separate Simpsons game, that game being Bart vs the Space Mutants. It was developed by Imagineering, who you may not have heard of, and that's because they were only around from 1986 to 1992. Oh, and also because so many of their games were considered awful. A lot of the games they developed were licensed games, and the reviews aren't pretty. Here's one from Super Gamer Magazine as an example, that gave their Barbie game on the NES a 15%. This game is so bad, I'd rather play with the doll. Despite the sexist undertones, 15%? Modern reviews wouldn't dare go that low on a review. Well, okay, it's a Barbie game on the NES, no one expects that to be good. What about Home Alone 2 for the Super Nintendo? I think people like that game, right? What did Super Gamer have to say about that one? Simplistic arcade adventure which makes very little use of the Super NES and soon gets irritatingly repetitive. If only it were lost in New York, 51%. Well, that's not great. But hey, what about Stealth ATF on the NES, which they also made? It doesn't look too bad, surely it can't score too low. An abysmal attempt at a flying game, a real bogey, 29%. Well, this is a pretty depressing start. Do I dare even ask what they thought of the game we're looking at today, Bart vs the Space Mutants? What a surprise, the game is as good as the cartoon, features all the characters and some very challenging gameplay, 91%, game of gold! Well damn, maybe we're in for a treat! We're talking about a game that's better than the original Super Mario Bros, according to Super Gamer Magazine. It must be pretty good. We're going to be seeing Imagineering a lot as we go through every Simpsons game, alongside the publisher for Bart vs the Space Mutants, Acclaim. Acclaim is another studio that isn't really known for quality. Back when I had my N64 on GameCube, the Acclaim name on a box ironically meant that it was going to be a 6 out of 10, and something you could probably skip. Acclaim started out as a publisher in the late 80s, pumping out license game after license game. They didn't care what the license was, as long as it had some sort of fan base. Acclaim made so many games out of 80s and 90s franchises that it's not surprising to see them get in on the Simpsons fad. Bar vs the Space Mutants released in February 1991 and was a success, being the second best selling game in the US for the month of February and eventually selling over a million copies. Gary Kitchen, the director and a designer on the game, has stated that the game started development before the first episode of the show ever aired. It was originally meant to be released before Christmas in 1990, but they missed that deadline and it came out in early 1991 instead. This didn't give the developers much more time though, with Kitchen reflecting back on the game, saying there wasn't enough polish due to this lack of time, which meant the game ended up being too hard. I did play this when I was younger, and I'm sure I didn't like it, but it can't be the game being bad or too hard, no no no, we're talking about gamer gold here people. How about we jump into the game and see how kind time has been for Bart vs the Space Mutants. You straight away start with a shot of the Simpsons sitting on the sofa watching TV. Wouldn't say it looks too great. Nice to see Bart wearing an orange t-shirt. Lots of Bart merchandise around this time had Bart in a blue t-shirt, including the Simpsons arcade game, so it's actually pretty nice seeing him in the correct colours. They didn't get everything right though, as Maggie is in all green, and they gave Marge an orange dress. There's a picture on the wall behind them as well, and I'm assuming that's meant to be Grandpa. It looks a lot closer to Sloth from the Goonies. Or a potato. It also just says The Simpsons. It doesn't have the actual name of the game. And apart from the UFO outside the window, this doesn't really represent the game that we're about to play at all. Leaving the game on the title screen will have the credits play on The Simpsons TV. That's pretty creative honestly, but what are those things? I talked about The Simpsons arcade game being weird and having strange things thrown in there, but at least the game kept within the look of the show. These don't look anything like something that would fit in with The Simpsons at all, and are just pretty horrible to look at. Pressing start takes us into the game, which starts with an opening cutscene where we see the stars in the night sky, and there's dialogue between two aliens who talk about coming down to Springfield to take over people's bodies and enslave the human race. Bart sees all this and looks slightly shocked. Good thing he had the sunglasses on that shows him that they're aliens, 
and we cut into the UFO where the aliens talk about needing purple objects to field a weapon that they'll use to take over the world. So they're heading to Springfield to steal all the purple objects. You're quickly dumped into the game and told to remove all purple objects you can find. So I want to say the idea of having Bart take on aliens for the sake of a video game plot and setting, so you can have some enemies for Bart to take on, that's fine. Kids taking on something larger than themselves that's a bit supernatural is a very 80s, 90s idea, so I'm on board. What I don't get are these alien designs. If you watched season one of The Simpsons, picked up the game because you liked the show, and saw these creatures in the first minute of the game, you would be so confused. There were already space mutant designs in season one, and that would have matched much better for the game. The tone is very bizarre. Having these two aliens chat to each other like this and the graphics here, it just makes no effort to match the show. This could have been a tie-in for any cartoon character. If this was Scooby-Doo versus the Space Mutants, it would have made just as much sense. The whole time an 8-bit version of the Simpsons main theme is playing as well, which creates an even bigger tonal mismatch. How does this song match with these aliens? It doesn't, and this whole opening has such an uncanny feeling because of it. What we have here is a platformer, with this first stage having some puzzle elements as you try and figure out how to get rid of all the purple objects. Now, I have to say straight away, I was originally playing the PAL version of the game on an emulator. As someone who lives in Europe, I wanted to stick to what I would have played as a kid, and it turns out that was a terrible decision. I was playing the emulated PAL version that feels much slower compared to the US emulated one. At first I thought it was the fact that PAL games used to run slower back during this era of console games, but I got myself a proper NES and a physical copy of the game to try the real PAL version, and it felt much closer to the US one, so I think it's just emulation issues. With Bart vs the Space Mutants having quite slow and awkward controls already, playing the PAL emulated version was painful, and made things much more difficult. After stage 1 I switched to the US version and stuck to that, but my initial impressions were a bit skewed by this PAL slowness. Anyway, first thing you notice when starting the game is a red alien jumping back and forth. I've played enough video games to know what to do here, you jump on his head and you take him out, so let's give that a go. Oh, I took damage. So it turns out the majority of the enemies in the game are invincible, or at least in stage 1, the very first stage in the game I will add, so straight away you encounter unkillable enemies. Enemies are used more like obstacles that can move, they don't generally attack you and are just in the way to do damage. With this being the first enemy, it will be more than likely that it will kill you, as Bar can only take two hits, and there's no health pickups in the game. Underneath the alien is a purple bin, but we have no way of making that not purple yet, so let's move on. A little further on there's a spray can up high. You can jump on windows to climb up there, but still can't reach it with a jump. So how do you get it? Well, I don't want to moan about the controls so soon, but we need to talk about these controls. The A button jumps, and the B button uses whatever weapon or main item you have equipped. For this level that'll be the red spray can. If you press the A and B button together, you can do a much bigger jump than your normal one. What the game wants you to do, and I have to stress again, at the very beginning of the first stage, is press A and B together, or hold B after jumping to do a higher bounce and get the can. Oh, and there's an alien that's very easy to hit when you land if you do successfully get that can. There is momentum in this game, but unlike something like Super Mario Bros where you hold B to allow yourself to run, and then use momentum to achieve bigger jump, this game goes from walking to then instantly doing a bigger jump, based on whether you're pressing B, and it makes things much harder to judge. You go from not really moving to a huge jump, and then back again, and that constant switching between those two makes the gameplay feel so stilted. There is a run, but you have to hold the jump button to do it, which means you have to jump in order to run, and then you can't jump out of a run, as you have to let go of the run button to stop running to then jump. It's as awkward as it sounds. After getting the can, you then backtrack to the start of the level, dodging the invincible aliens and spray the bin. This game creates such a bad first impression. It's confusing, the controls are weird, and it's not shy about killing you straight away. Okay, so we have 24 purple objects to take care of, but maybe we can get to the end of the stage and progress without doing that. Maybe that's more of a bonus objective for a good ending or something? Unlikely, but I want to see the end of the stage anyway. Progressing through the stage, you see a few purple objects, and some of those are high up on buildings. So this whole level is a straight shot from left to right, 
with no vertical camera scrolling. What you see is what you get. It means in terms of actual platforming, certain parts of the background you can stand on to climb up. There is nothing that tells you which things you can and can't stand on. There was no attempt here to create a visual language so players can understand what they can and can't use as platforms. This is something other NES games suffer with as well with their more limited graphics, but I don't think I've ever seen it this bad. You have to just try and jump on everything, which isn't that fun. Especially when you got times like this where you can't jump on the top of the door, but you can jump on top of the window in the door? That just doesn't make any sense. Some of the purple objects require you to spray while in the air, which raises another problem with the controls. B both sprays the can and uses your high jump. There are times where you'll want a high jump and may spray the can in the air instead, and times you want to spray and it gets cancelled out by the high jump. It's just a clumsy control screen. It's trying to do too much with too little buttons. Okay, so we reach halfway through the level and next to the statue of Jebediah Springfield is a skateboard, which Bart automatically jumps on and we get a little skateboarding section. This took me so off guard. Straight away you have to jump over these lines of dogs that appear, followed by aliens. You don't go super fast, but Bart is placed in the middle of the screen, so you get very little time to react to the things coming at you. The last bit has Jimbo Jones chasing you down on his skateboard, and if he touches you, you take damage. You can slow yourself down, but it tries to be somewhat realistic with the movement, so there's wind up and wind down time when moving on the skateboard, making it so awkward to try and avoid Jimbo, as you have to try and slow down and jump over him when he's coming up behind you. I believe you're meant to avoid Jimbo by going up and down instead, as there is an extra plane here for movement, so things can go past you, but it's so hard to judge that in the end I ended up just going as high as I could and jumping over everything that came at me. Finishing the skateboard section takes us to about the last third of the stage. It's more aliens to avoid, although this time they have even stricter windows to get past them, causing me to run out of lives a few times and game over. Again, in the very first stage of the game. There are a few Simpsons locations, like Barney's Boulderama, the Quickie Mart, and at the very beginning of the stage was Moe's. I appreciate them putting these famous shops in the game, but it doesn't help the game actually feel like The Simpsons. The look of the game is so sterile, there's no style to any of this, it's so basic and bland. Look at the box art, look how much more fun it looks with the ideas of aliens causing havoc in Springfield, and now look at this game. NES games of course could only do so much, but this looks more like a Commodore 64 game that was ported to the NES rather than a proper NES game. This wasn't an early NES game either, this is 1991, six years into the NES's lifespan, and the Super Nintendo released in the same year in North America. It's not on the same level as games that came before it like Mega Man, Punch-Out or Super Mario Bros 3. I know it's probably not fair to compare to those games, but even the colours here are dull. This is based off a cartoon, it should be bright, colourful and fun. This just seems too drab and dull. At the end of the stage there's Springfield Retirement Castle and going past that there's a barrier that blocks us from going forward. Okay, so we have to get rid of all those purple objects to beat the level. Fair enough, that's what the game told us at the beginning. After some tedious going back and forth throughout the level, I've managed to get it down to 8 left but I can't find any more. There's the purple windows at the Retirement Castle that I can't seem to reach, a couple of birds I can't do anything with, and there's the top of a door that says wet paint, but spraying it with my spray can doesn't do anything. Feels like I'm missing something here, so how about we check the manual? As confusing as this game is, back then they did include manuals for you to read, so only fair to see what it says. It's a decent little manual, lots of artwork of the Simpsons family, although it looks like Matt Groening forgot how to draw mouse properly. Weird to see some of these have Bart with his orange shirt and then some in blue, I'm guessing most of these pictures were not made specifically for the manual. There's a tip section in the back, here we go. Okay, so in Springfield, try to discover what ledges Bart can stand on. Oh, so that was an intentional design choice. Imagine putting that in the manual for Super Mario Bros or a good platforming game. It's an insane thing to say. It's listing five stages to beat. That's pretty terrifying to think there's four more stages after this one, but let's suppress that thought for now. And hey, here we go. Other useful items. It says here that you can spend coins and items and you can buy items by going into shops. And if we go back into the game, yeah, you can enter some shops. You can't enter all shops and once again, nothing to visually tell you which ones, but there's a few shops here and we can buy some items. This is where the more puzzle elements of the game come in. 
Figuring out how to get rid of the purple objects is intended to be a puzzle. So with the top of the door we can't spray it with red paint from our spray can, which makes no sense, but we can go into the shop, buy a wrench, use that wrench on the water hydrant, and because it's wet paint, the water washes off the purple paint. I actually like this concept and idea for a game. Exploring a level, picking up different items, and using them in different ways to interact with things. It's a level of environment interaction for puzzles that I wouldn't expect for an NES game, and on paper, this is a really cool idea. There's even secrets you can find, like next to Moe's you can use coins on the phone and prank call Moe to get him to come outside. Sadly, this is all let down by execution. There are several purple objects that you can soft lock yourself out of completing, meaning if you don't do them, you have to force a game over and just try again. Like you need rockets and cherries to get rid of purple objects, but you only get so many, and if you miss with them and run out of money to buy more, there's nothing you can do, and the stage becomes unbeatable. It shouldn't need to be said, but any game where you can softlock a level is poorly designed and poorly fought out. You might not even know you've softlocked yourself when you're first playing it. The logic of some of these puzzles also makes no sense. Like the purple windows at the top of the retirement castle. Instead of going up there and painting them or washing them, you have to fire rockets at them. Which I don't even think destroys them, it just gets rid of the purple. The environment interactions are cool, but the logic just doesn't work. You only have limited items, you get way too many items to use, and you have to awkwardly switch between them all whenever you want to use one. You have to explore to find some of these interactions, but it's easy to get killed, and generally speaking, it feels like the game punishes you for experimenting. Like when you jump into bushes, sometimes you get items, but sometimes a bee comes out and damages you. In a game where you only have two hits before being killed, that's a really harsh punishment just for exploring, which the game clearly wants you to do. If they wanted this to be a game where you explore, then making the enemies invincible with pretty strict patterns for you to get past, and quite slow and clunky controls, was just horrible, and the game is conflicted between wanting to be a tough platformer, and wanting to be an exploration puzzle game. With the items in hand we can finish off the stage. After getting the rockets, I managed to get it down to two objects left. I thought one of them was this purple keep off sign, but nope, that doesn't count, and I thought it might have to do with the magnet and whistles that you can buy, but nope, they aren't needed, and the whistle summons a dog that causes you damage. Wonderful. The first one I was missing was a policeman. If you jump on where it says keep off, you can land on an invisible platform and a purple policeman shows up. When he shows up, you have about a 2 second window to spray him to turn him red. If you miss, you may be soft logged and have to game over to try again. The last one was Barney's Boulderama, where you have to shoot a rocket at the sign to turn it on. Not the wrong part of the sign though, the end of the sign doesn't count. There's actually one more purple object than you need to beat the stage technically, as you can also spray Mo as his purple. Finally, that's all of them done, and it says I can go to the end of the stage on the right. There's actually a key you can buy from the shops to get to the start and end of the stage, which is really handy. Although if you use it at the retirement castle, you end up at Moe's, but you can't use it at Moe's to go back. You instead have to go to a different house further down the road, and that warps you back to the retirement castle. Just throw that on the pile of things that don't make sense in this game at all. Reaching the end of the stage again puts us in a water balloon fight with Nelson. I died quickly on my first attempt, which was pretty depressing, but it's not too hard once you get the timing down, as you can just jump over all his water balloons. Maggie can also help you here, but only if you collect all the Maggie letters. You would have noticed that I've been using the x-ray goggles a lot, and that's because the random people that will pass you can either be normal humans or an alien. Scanning them with the x-ray goggles shows you if they're aliens, and if they are, you can jump on their head, collect an orb, and you get one of the letters. They don't interact with you, they just fly across the screen at certain points in the stage, but if you jump on them and they're real, you do take damage. It's another idea that I wouldn't say is awful, but with how clunky this game is, I can't say it does anything but add frustration when you're just trying to beat a stage by avoiding the enemies and trying to work out what you need to do. It took me 1 hour and 40 minutes to beat this stage. Stage 1, the first one of the entire game. Some of this is because I was initially playing the PAL emulated version, but it takes so much time to figure out the stage and put that all together, that the game is begging you to stop playing it before you make any real progress. 
Stage 2 is the shopping mall, where the purple object thing is completely scrapped, and now we're collecting hats. Weird, but let's not question it too much. The game says knock off hats from people's heads, so here we go, here's someone with a hat. Let's jump on him and I took damage. A little further on there's plastic bags to avoid. I wasn't able to and lost my last life, so it's game over, which means I'm going back to the title screen and starting all the way back in stage 1. This is just inexcusable. It takes so much time and effort to figure out one stage, and there's no safe system or any type of password feature. Again, this released in 1991. A game like this should have a way to continue your progress. The fact that you always start from stage 1 is really awful, but I will say, replaying stage 1 again, because I spent so much time in it, I was able to beat it in 8 minutes without losing a single life. That's actually pretty cool that I was able to improve at the game, but it still doesn't excuse no passwords, and I don't see myself beating this without running out of lives, which means it's time to cheat. For the rest of the game I played it on the American version with infinite lives. Didn't cheat in any other way, just to say, and I wanted to experience the game as intended, but to see the rest of the game, I don't want to drive myself insane. Stage 2 strips away the puzzle concept entirely, instead focusing on being a pure platformer. No items, no shops, no environment interacts. It's nice for the second stage to already mix things up, but having to rely on the controls for the platforming here is rough. You have to collect hats, with lots of them placed around the stage, and you can knock off people's hats by jumping underneath them and then picking it up after it falls down. It means you can't softlock this stage, unlike in stage 1, which I guess is something? You're going from left to right, going up each of the different floors of the mall, dodging enemies and obstacles, platforming, and taking on this mini-boss that appears three times, which looks like Principal Skinner, but I think it's meant to be a magician possessed by the aliens, it's hard to tell. In stage 1 you were dodging aliens, but now you're dodging bags, shoes, rabbits out of a hat, giant rings, and basically anything they could think of related to shopping and magical items. There was just no effort here to have this make any sense. Why go through all the trouble of theming the game around an alien invasion if you're then in stage 2 just gonna make random objects be the enemies? The way they approached platforms for this level was the same as well, with floating lollipops and later magic wands being used. I am definitely not asking for the game to be realistic, but the inconsistencies with the game world and what platforms and enemies are makes this all feel so off and can cause a bit of frustration as you try and figure out what everything even is. These red and white poles, would you say they should cause damage? Because they do, and there's no reasonable explanation to why. Stage 2 ends up being very long. I'm glad I had infinite lice enabled, as there's four different floors to go through in this mall, with lots of enemies with their own movement patterns to learn and avoid, platforming sections over instant kill, I want to say concrete, and also the magician skinner fights. The developers did know this was tough, as after each platforming section they give you a crusty panel which are the extra lives in this game. Doesn't make sections like jumping on the spinny lollipops any better though, these controls don't support the precise platforming that's required to get across. After getting to the end with enough hats, you get to take on the notorious babysitter bandit from the final episode of season 1, Some Enchanted Evening. If you take out enough aliens this time, you get Marge helping instead, although she actually makes the fight longer. You have to dodge suitcases that come on down, jump on them to launch them upwards, and if they hit the boss it does damage. Marge blocks some of these suitcases from falling down, meaning you can't use them to damage her. With enough hits we're off to stage 3, Krusty Land. We get another switch up of the items to collect and destroy, with it this time being Balloon. Like a lot of things in this game, they didn't care about having items that would make sense for aliens to collect. It's whatever they wanted it to be for each stage, so just take out the objects that the game tells you to. It's a pretty good start for this stage, with a few carnival games to play to earn coins and help you take out some of the balloons. They're pretty basic, but still charming. It's going back to having things you can interact with like in the first stage. We even have some optional vertical sections. They don't properly scroll, but you can climb up and go higher in certain parts of the levels. I like the giant crusty head as well, with his eyes following the player as they go past. This stage is much better than stage 2, but still isn't fun to play. Outside of the carnival games at the beginning, the rest is focused on platforming again, with more aggressive enemies than before, with these clowns flying from off screen constantly. 
When playing the carnival games, you can even accidentally jump on people's heads and die. It's just so sloppy the way things are spawned into levels across this game. Halfway through the level, you get to enter Krusty's Funhouse, which has this door puzzle, where I think you have to try and make all the doors disappear by flipping them, but you don't get much time to do it, and you can't retry it if you fail. This is followed up by a platforming bit where there are pipes shooting up air, which you can float on, and you have to wait for the air to shoot out the right pipe to float across. I don't understand why they thought this type of platforming challenge made sense for this game. You're wrestling with the controls and physics here to get this work, and once again, it feels awful. Alright, we're finally at the end of the stage, and this time it's a boss fight against SciShow Bob. Took me a little bit to figure out what to do, but you have to wait for him to land, and then jump on his feet to do damage. So far the bosses have been a highlight. They're a bit on the easy side, but after some of these stages, it's really nice having something a little bit easier at the end. Each one of these boss fights has been a direct reference from Season 1 of the show. From throwing water balloons at Nelson, dealing with the suitcases from the babysitter bandit, and stomping on SciShow Bob's feet. It's these sort of details that help tie it more to The Simpsons, and almost makes me overlook what they did to poor Lisa. Are these dots meant to be her eyes, or an eye and a mouth? Either way, good lord, she's a monster. One last stomp on Bob's feet, and it's off to stage 4, the Natural Museum. Each stage up to this point has had its problems, with stage 1 with its obtuse design and unclear platforms, to the overly long stage 2 with awkward platforming, and stage 3 having annoying and aggressive enemies. Stage 4 combines all these elements, and it's a miserable time. For this stage we're taking out exit signs, which is pretty easy to do. You only have to take out 6 using a dark gun, but there's a lot more than 6 to take out, and you get plenty of dark gun ammo. The gimmick of this level is that it's a museum, so you're going through different exhibits from different periods of time, and just look at this jungle one at the start. For the NES, this background is really detailed and, dare I say, looks good? The problem is, is that it's almost too detailed. It doesn't match the rest of the game at all, and reinforces the fact that this game doesn't have a proper art style. It just does whatever it wants, and it feels generic overall because of that. This level is full of vindictive enemy placement, putting them right where they're at their most annoying. We finally have platforms that are marked a different colour to show you can stand on them, with the yellow on the branches of this tree, although they're still difficult to see, and after that you're jumping on tiny crocodile platforms which, if you slip, it's an instant kill. There's a mini boss at the end of this exhibit with a plant creature that's easy to deal with by jumping on its head, and then it's back to the museum. I was exhausted just from this jungle section. The controls and movement don't allow for this type of gameplay and level design. It's so easy to get here, so easy to make a small mistake and get punished for it. It took me so many attempts to clear this due to these tiny platforms and horrible enemy placement, but sadly, this is the easiest part of the level. After that, we're back in the museum, and I need to mention these laser grids. You have to time your jumps to avoid them, but they're at an angle, presumably to make them look more 3D and dynamic, but it makes it really hard to judge where they are, so I ended up high jumping them and hoping for the best. The next exhibit starts with these stone panels that took me so many attempts just to figure out what was happening. The first one goes red, so I assumed you have to jump to the next one, and that would also glow red to show you landed on the correct panel. That's completely wrong. You have to wait, and eventually another panel glows red, and you can jump onto that one. It's a tedious idea for a platforming section. I lost so many lives just trying to figure this out, because it's an instant kill if you mess up, and even when I did do it, it was boring. After that, there's a very similar section with blocks coming out of the wall. It's actually quite easy, but it's got the same problem as the lasers. They try to make it look 3D, and it makes it unclear where the platform starts and where it ends. After an annoying part where you have to collect objects by jumping into Egyptian statues while avoiding infinitely falling spiders, we have another short museum section before reaching the final exhibit, which is dinosaur themed, which oddly also feels like it's space themed at the same time. This exhibit drove me mad. We have random falling rocks from the top of the screen to avoid, and once again they make no effort to show you what you can and can't stand on. You have to jump on these dinosaur skeletons to get across this tar pit. A fun idea, but some parts of the skeletons you can jump on and some you just can't. The enemy placement is particularly harsh as well, with raptors flying down at just the wrong time every time to mess up your jumps, and they have giant hitboxes that are much bigger than the sprites. Finally, you get across the tarp here, 
get hit straight away by a projector out of nowhere, nice beginner's trap guys, and you have to take on a dinosaur. This might be the worst boss I've ever played in a video game. Like where do I start? So first of all, the projectiles are really awkward to avoid with these controls. Second, you have to jump on his head to defeat him, but it's impossible to tell where you can jump on without just trying it and risking falling into an instant death pit. I had no idea you could even climb up on my first few attempts. There's nothing that indicates there are platforms you can stand on. Lastly, the hitboxes. There's a very specific point on the dinosaur's head that you have to jump on to damage it, but after that, it causes you to bounce up and you have to land on a different specific point on the dinosaur's head to not fall. If you miss either of these jumps, you fall into the pit and die. You have to do this three times while also landing back on an unmarked platform between each hit. It's just hoping and praying each time, and if you die, it's back to halfway through the tar pit section again. This took me so many attempts that I ended up getting really good at the tar pit. I used the technique of just going as fast as I could, and that worked out. This boss is everything that is wrong with this game gameplay wise. Horrible controls, unclear platforms, overly punishing health system, and so frustrating to play. On one attempt I even beat the boss, only to fall into the pit and die, which meant I had to do it all over again. Luckily after the dinosaur mini boss, the stage is nearly done, with a showdown against Dr. Marvin Monroe. He shoots electric balls along the floor, which are easy to dodge, and after a few jumps to the head he goes down, and we can take on the final stage, the nuclear power plant. After the pain that was stage 4, this one ended up being my favourite level in the game. What we have here is a maze. You have to find 16 power rods and drop them off in the basement. You can only carry 4 rods at a time, but you can give some to Marge and she'll help drop those off. There's no hidden platforms, no instant kill pits, it's about exploring and learning the layout of the level. The enemies are back to only being aliens, so nothing flying from off screen or spawning at the exact wrong time, and you can even kill the aliens this time. By finding and using the donut item, you can summon Homer that kills all enemies on screen. This is so much better, and feels like what the game was supposed to play like, although this stage is still not as fun as it should be, as it's let down by a couple of issues. Throughout the level you'll find Lisa, who gives you combinations for locked doors on each floor. I ended up not finding Lisa every time and just guessing the combination for most of these, but the problem is that you have to enter the code every time you want to go through the door. With this being a maze where you're going back and forth a lot, this gets old quick. And while this being a maze is cool, it's perhaps a little bit too confusing. There are 5 floors to explore, with 3 lifts and 2 sets of stairs to get between them, and walls blocking off each part of the floor. Some of the lifts also only go to specific floors. It means getting to specific points can be difficult, and by the time I got to 3 rods remaining, I ended up looking up where I needed to go. Turns out the very last one is with Maggie. Nothing in the game to tell you that, but interacting with Maggie after finding the other 15 beats the game. No final boss. Instead, there's another conversation between the aliens about Bart being a hero. You get this really bizarre screen showing a 3D render of Bart being part of Mount Rushmore. It's oddly similar to his model in Road Rage. And then you're kicked back to the title screen. Nothing special happens when being in the game. The music is the same throughout, and it's the same as if you got a game over. I can't imagine suffering through this game as a kid to get such a weak ending, but how much you have to do to even get here without cheating, it's such a slap in the face. How about we get this game added to the ranking? As always, I'll be ranking this based on whether it's a good game and its value to a Simpsons fan. For is it a good game? Absolutely not. Awkward controls, horrible movement, terrible level design with some of the worst platforming I've played, and just mean enemy placement. Top this all off with ugly graphics and no save or continue system, and you have a miserable experience. There's a few positives. The environment puzzles can be interesting, and when it moves away from the platforming, it can be okay. Ultimately, this is a broken platformer, and on a console that was known for platformers, this one can be forgotten. As a Simpsons fan, there's a few things to enjoy, like some of the secrets, and the bosses were really nice references, recreating parts of Season 1. The graphics let it down though. Each level has their own references to the show, sure, but with the poor art style, the references feel weak. This game could have been any franchise if you swap out a few signs, which means outside of maybe spending 10 minutes of stage 1, Simpsons fans can largely skip it. 
I'm putting it underneath the Simpsons Arcade for Commodore 64. While I needed Unlimited Lives to be that game as well, at least I had a decent time when I did that, and unlike Bart vs the Space Mutants, there was more charm to that game. I wish I could say I was done, but remember how the Simpsons game had that one advert claiming it was coming out on everything because it was releasing on so many consoles? Well, Bart vs the Space Mutants came to more platforms than the Simpsons game did, with there being 10 different versions available. The first wave of ports were for the Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST and MS-DOS, all developed by Ocean Software. Starting with the Amiga version, and there's a brand new animated intro just for this and the MS-DOS versions. It shows Bart hanging out at home and seeing the aliens arrive. It's clearly not official art, with Bart not looking right at all, like why did they give him such a big nose? But this intro is great. It's so unexpected to have this here, and for 1991, having unique Simpsons animation just for the game, that's pretty incredible. Getting into the game itself, it's a good first impression, with the graphics having a brand new coat of paint. It's much more detailed while still being cartoony and colourful. We get Blue Shirt Bart as well, even though his shirt is orange on the title screen and in the animated intro, well, alright then. The biggest change after the graphics were the controls. They only had one button to use, which means jumping is now done by pressing up, and items are used by pressing down. This actually works better than expected. Because the original controls so poorly in the first place, it doesn't feel any worse than the NES original. I actually like pressing down to use items, it's much quicker to do it that way. It took a bit to get used to, but playing the first stage, I felt like this was the better version. I was hoping for a few more quality of life improvements. There are tweaks, like when you're using the key at the retirement castle, it sends you to the correct building now. Unfortunately once you hit stage 2 and have to dodge the more aggressive enemies and the platforming gets harder, the problems reveal themselves. Everything moves a bit faster, which means you have less time to react and it makes things hard to dodge. Bart is also a bit faster and it makes him a bit more slippery, meaning it's much easier to slip off a platform. I struggled to get past the first section of the shopping mall as I kept falling off the platforms and later when the red and white pole showed up, they were much harder to get past. If we're talking about just the first stage, the Amiga version is better, but I can't recommend this version if you're looking to beat it because it's too quick and slippery. The Amstrad CPC, Atari ST and MS-DOS versions are pretty much the same as the Amiga one. I wasn't able to play all of these, I did play some of the MS-DOS version and I watched some footage of the rest and I couldn't spot any major differences, they have the same graphics, same controls, same physics. For putting these ports on the list, I'm going to have to put them underneath the NES one. It pains me to do it. With the animated intro, the better graphics and some control improvements, it should be better, but I can't forgive the slippery platforming. It makes a frustrating game even more frustrating to complete. Let's jump over to the Commodore 64, where we're guaranteed for something different. I'm going to start with Praise, because I think this looks better than the NES version, which I complained about saying that that looked like a Commodore 64 game. The aliens look pretty terrible and there's a loss of detail in certain areas, sure, but there are better outlines and what things are are more clear. The sprite for Bart is much much better and there's better high level definition across the board. With this being on the Commodore 64 we have another one button control scheme with up on the joystick being jump. It has the same control scheme as the Amiga version and sadly has the same control issues as well. I got to stage 2 and once again struggled to make these jumps due to how easily Bart slipped off the platforms. I believe the problem might be that because up is jump and holding jump also causes you to run, when you're landing on a platform you're actually landing in a running state which causes you to slip off. Either way it fails that test and is as bad as the Amiga version because of it. I struggled much more with stage 1 as well. I've played this stage so many times at this point and I can beat it on NES pretty easily, but I kept soft locking the level due to running out of items like the spray can or coins. As I was curious, I used a level skip cheat to get to the power plant stage, one that I quite liked, and found it was completely butchered. The jumps are so much tighter and harder to do that it's a nightmare just getting around, let alone figuring out the maze. I couldn't play this for long, it was miserable. I'm ranking this last, even underneath their Simpsons for MS-DOS. The charm of the Commodore 64 version of The Simpsons for Arcade gave that game a huge boost, 
which I can't say the same for Bath vs. the Space Mutants, making it hard to excuse the terrible gameplay. Alright, finally at the last pull of this wave, and this time it's on the ZX Spectrum. I don't think I've ever played a ZX Spectrum game, so I don't know what we're in for here. Like the Commodore 64 port, we're looking at a stripped back version, but this is the most basic one we've had yet. It doesn't support screen scrolling, which means the game takes place on individual screens rather than one continuous stage. The graphics look like an LED game. I actually don't think that's all that bad really, but the colours are more limited and there's less going on on screen. Controls wise it's another one button control scheme, but this time they made the very smart move of removing the super high jump. Instead of requiring you to hold the fire button and up on the stick to do a high jump, there's only one type of jump which is always high. It makes such a difference being able to jump higher every time and not having to press two buttons, because the jump is much more consistent. It's easier to judge your jumps and time them now. This is how every version should have been. No sluggish low jumping with awkward two button presses for a higher one, just one proper usable jump. I was ready to declare this the best version, but I really struggled to get past stage one. Despite the better controls, I still found myself hitting aliens more than in the NES version, in part because movement overall is a bit quicker, and the aliens move so much faster, and because of this I couldn't beat the first stage. I could at least beat stage 1 on the Amiga, so despite some clear improvements in the ZX Spectrum port, it has to go slightly underneath the Amiga and MS-DOS versions. Sadly for me, we are not finished yet. All the versions I've discussed so far came out in 1991, but the following year in 1992 we got a second wave of port, this time coming to all the Sega platforms, the Mega Drive, Game Gear and the Master System. These ports were published by Flying Edge, who were a subdivision of Acclaim, and seems to be handled by the people who worked on the other ports, although Ocean Software uncredited for this one. The Mega Drive version is the one I actually played when I was younger. I don't remember liking it, but frankly this is our last chance to play a version of this game that is better than the NES. We get a new title screen and a new image of the Simpsons sitting on the sofa, which looks pretty nice. The main thing I noticed when starting this game though is the music. Each version so far had music that tried to recreate the Simpsons theme in some shape or form. The music for this one has been completely redone and we get this annoying tune that I think is trying to sound like something from the Simpsons, but it's just horrible to hear. The game goes for a completely different art style and I can see what they were going for. They wanted this to look cartoony and bright, so we get something quite simplistic and bold to try and match the show. I can't say I like it too much. It's not a bad effort, but it almost looks cheap. The lack of detail here, especially when compared to some amazing looking games that were on the Mega Drive, means this one looks like a budget game in comparison. The Amiga port isn't as clean as this one, but it made a bit more of an effort to make its own style, and wasn't afraid to add in a bit more detail, and I think that approach worked better compared to this. Controls wise it's similar to the NES version. Main difference is that you have to pause to scroll through your items to select them, which honestly is a decent way of doing it. That's probably all the nice things I'm going to say about this version, because this whole game feels broken, and it's a similar issue to what the ZX Spectrum version had. Enemies and the game as a whole moves too fast. It's so hard not to take hits when everything moves much faster than it should. This is a slow platformer, but the aliens shoot up and down so fast it leaves little room for error. Look at the skateboarding section, it goes so fast that I had to jump consistently just to try and survive. This game relies on you using the high jump, but it doesn't work half the time. Trying to get through the stage 2 platforming sections felt impossible as it was a 50-50 chance to see if you would get a high jump or a normal jump, and the normal jump meant you wouldn't make it and you would die. It doesn't have the same slippery issues, but the platforming suffers greatly due to this, and avoiding enemies is harder as they move so fast and you don't know what jump you're going to do when you jump. In the NES version, you could press the B button halfway through a jump to make it a high jump and give yourself a little bit more control. It didn't feel great, but you could do that if it was needed and was helpful for avoiding enemies. Because the Mega Drive version is so much quicker, that's no longer an option. You either do a normal jump or a high jump. When you jump, you fall too quickly to make any sort of proper mid-jump adjustments. I'm ranking it below the ZX Spectrum version, but above the Simpsons for Arcade for MS-DOS. The only reason it goes higher than the Commodore 64 port is because I was able to beat the first stage and it does have those extra buttons, making it a little bit better. Not by much though, it's still pretty bad. 
Next up is the Master System port, which rather than taking the 8-bit NES original and porting that, they took the Mega Drive version, scaled it down to 8-bit, and made it run on the Master System. It doesn't look too bad for a Master System conversion, and it largely is the same game, apart from a few key differences. There are a lot less buttons on the Master System controller compared to the Mega Drive one, and even less than the NES one, so like some of the other ports we've seen, they had to change the controls. Instead of using the same scheme as the one button versions, which actually worked pretty okay, they tried a different approach, which is much, much worse. Pressing down goes through your items, and you have to press down and the spray can button to use one. The high jump works the same way as the Mega Drive version as well, which means you have to press two buttons to do it, meaning you have to press two buttons at the same time a lot, and hope they work. The run also doesn't seem to work properly. Holding jump only allows you to run on higher platforms, and you can't run on the ground, which I think is just a bug. The enemies are too fast yet again, and you're still pretty slow playing as Bar, so it was so easy to take damage. I was miserable playing this game. It's the least amount of progress I made in any version I'm covering for this video, as I could barely get through stage 1 without getting a game over. It's so easy to get hit and die and has all the same problems as the Mega Drive port, but with even worse controls. Really, really bad stuff here. It crashed while playing the first stage, which I took as a sign to stop playing this terrible game. The Game Gear version is a downgraded port of the Master System version, so it has all the same control problems, but this time with Screen Crunch. Screen Crunch is an easy thing to complain about with these old handheld ports, but it doesn't matter too much for a game like this. It's the same level of awful as the Master System one. I managed to get a little further in stage 1 on the Game Gear, but that's not saying much. They're going dead last on the list, underneath the Commodore 64 ports. The Mega Drive version had a lot of problems, but both of these make it even worse. These versions don't even make me angry. It's just really hard playing either of these, to the point where I can't even get slightly sucked into them. They're bad, and that's that. After all I've just gone through, it feels strange to rank the NES version as the best one. When I first played it on NES, I didn't have a good time with it, and some of these ports have clear improvements. I decided to go back to the NES original and play it a bit more on actual hardware, and I managed to get all the way up to stage 4 before I get a game over. I wouldn't say I had an amazing time playing it, but it's clearly the most playable version, and in my opinion the one that's most realistic to beat without cheating. The controls are bad, but the level design does fit within the awful controls, and each port I've played upsets that balance between control and level design, and each time it results in a more difficult and worse experience. This was really tough playing all these versions of Bar First of the Space Mutants. I can't really recommend any of them to Simpsons fans. You get a few references that are alright in there, and with this being the first Simpsons game on consoles, there's some value to that, but that's about it. Doesn't help that none of them are particularly good games either. How about we try and end on a slightly lighter note, because there was an 11 version made of Bar First of the Space Mutants, that being an LED game. It is an official port as it was made by Acclaim, as you can see by the giant logo on the back. Let's put some batteries in and see what we have. It takes place on one screen where you're in the nuclear power plant and trying to get power rods over to Homer, inspired by stage 5 of the main game. You have to avoid the aliens, jump and get the rods, and then make your way across the screen. I didn't beat the first level of this. It's really hard to know what's going on and dodging the aliens feels like luck. It was pretty confusing which wasn't helped by the music, as it's playing this tinny version of the Simpsons theme at you really loudly. The game also stops every time you get hit, and every three hits is the game over, so you don't really get a good feeling of what's going on. Maybe a kid with too much time on their hands could figure this out, but a simple little time waster would have been so nice instead of what we got. I won't rank it or put it on the list, as that opens up a whole world of LED Simpsons games, which, if I want to put those on, I'll cover those in a separate episode. And that's finally it for Bar First of the Space Mutants. Thank you very much for watching, feel free to leave me a comment if you agree or disagree with what I've said in the video, and join me next time where I'll be ranking Bart Simpson's Escape from Camp Deadly. If it's as bad as Bart First of the Space Mutants was, I don't know how I'm going to get through all these games.